Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, our experience with um, Ansible. Um, this, the, this is basically the stack that we're using, uh, but I'll take you through that. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? I'll just do some introductions first, and then I'll talk a little bit about our use case, uh, uh, the problem that we needed to solve. Um, then I'll talk a bit about Ansible, the design for the solution that we um, came up with, its implementation, and then I'll end. Okay. Okay. About me, I'm a, I'm not an born into IT, so I'm a metallurgical engineer. Uh, I started Xmenti uh, a few years ago. Um, I've been coding since 1982. Uh, who knows what that is? Okay, not many. Yeah. Okay. You should probably get a goodie bag for that. Um, and these are the tools that I work with most at the moment. Okay, um, the company, what do we do? We do pyrometallurgy, so anything below about 1,500 degrees Celsius is cold to us. Um, we also do uh, ice cream factory things, hydrometallurgy, which is water-based metallurgy. Uh, and metallurgy is basically getting the good stuff out of rocks, uh, chrome and metal, uh, uh, platinum and gold and all of those things, that's what we, that's what we work on. And we do a lot of process simulation work. We, we develop our own software, but we also heavy into open source um, process simulation. Uh, we're actually part of a community, OpenSim, similar to this, much smaller. Every year in Pretoria, we get together um, sharing our experiences uh, in the open source world on, on process simulation and modeling. We deliver. Uh, our services partly through web applications. Um, so the models that we build, we put it into our customers' hands. They can run them through the browser. Um, and we also have things like systems engineering, uh, a systems engineering platform and an information system for plants. And we, we love Python. Um, especially for engineers and scientists, I don't think there's a better language to, to use because it, you just get so much stuff. <laughs> Optimization and math and chemistry and ach, name it, it's there. So we just love it. Okay. Um, so our use case, a bit of background about it. Um, we've got uh, several, we, at, at the point, we had several application installations. Um, we used uh, digital ocean uh, virtual machines and uh, one or two physical machines. Um, and then we did automation with fabric. Who knows about fabric? Okay, fabric. Okay, um, now fabric was of limited help to us. There's a lot of scripting involved. If anybody disagrees, you can just shout. Uh, for me, it was basically hell. It was not nice. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we realized that the, the process simulation stuff that we do um, is really CPU heavy. And getting a lot of muscle um, online is, is expensive. Um, so we tend to, to use our own physical machines for that, uh, running the, the stuff that's really computationally intensive. Okay, now the scope of the use case, um, we have a limited number of machines available. Um, we have multiple customers that we need to serve. We, the customer data must be isolated. We work for the big boys, big corporates. Um, you, so you sign some documents where your wife and your children will be taken away if you do certain things. Um, so you, we need to be careful. We've got multiple applications, like I said earlier. And we also have multiple application configurations that we need to run. So we've got the production stuff, uh, but we also need to have access to training, uh, uh, training versions of the software. 
so that guys can wreck it uh, however uh, much they want. And we also, we, we need uh, testing. If we bring out a new version, uh, testing configuration is, is quite useful. And uh, this is, that's all the stuff that we need to take care of. Now, the, the, the tool stack that we use, you saw it on the first, the first page as well, but uh, the operating system we use is Ubuntu Server. Uh, we started off with 16.04. We're on 18.04 um, now. Uh, we use Docker as our container host. Uh, then uh, the database server, we use uh, Postgres. The application servers, we use um, Python for, for backend calculations and things. Uh, we use Django as the web framework, but uh, these days we, we only use uh, the Django REST framework. Uh, because we're trying to, to do the single page app thing, and that's why Ansible is there as well. Um, and uh, G Unicorn is just the WSI server. And then we use Nginx uh, for our reverse proxy, and uh, Let's Encrypt uh, for, the, for the certificates. Um, Tim mentioned it, that uh, if we, we don't store stuff in the, in the Docker, we store it in, in, on the host. Because if your Docker is corrupted or, or something like that, then you lose your, your stuff. Um, so we store that all on the outside. Okay, so that's our tool stack. The last little bit, we do remote backups on TarSnap. Uh, I don't know who, who knows about TarSnap. Okay, somebody on one of the forums told me about it. I want to kiss that guy. Um, but um, it's really great. It's very simple. Um, and uh, it, they basically store all your stuff encrypted, so they can do nothing with it, but, but you still hopefully can when you get it back. Um, so our key requirements for automation um, are as follows. Uh, we want to maximize ut uh, hardware utilization because uh, even though the calculations that we do are, are CPU heavy, they're all single threaded. So they can only use a single core at a time. Uh, so we can pack more applications on, onto a fairly simple machine and, 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 and make better use of it. We want a single point of configuration, or as close as we uh, could get to that. Uh, and we want to manage all the, 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 the life cycle stages, um, from uh, initial um, provisioning right through to maintenance. Um, simplicity is... I think uh, we heard in the first talk, uh, if you can get it, it's, it's good to have. Um, we, we'd like good uh, product documentation and whatever we script or build, that also needs to be well documented so that y the guy that comes after you can also actually f understand what you've done. Okay, so that's, those were the needs. Um, and uh, th this is in many of these things are in stark contrast with what we experienced with Fabric. Okay, so we selected Ansible. Um, it was nice because Ansible is based on stuff that we already know. Uh, we're a Python shop, largely, so it's built with Python. So you can kind of understand how the thing's mind works. It also, the templating behind um, Ansible is uh, Jinja. Um, so that's really nice because we know that as well. And then YAML is a really, really cool markup language. Um, if you pick it up today, you can probably do some cool stuff tomorrow. Uh, it's simple to learn. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, you get started really quickly. It's quite flexible. Uh, as you'll see, our use case was not a problem. Um, to implement with it. Um, there's no server-side configuration that you want, uh, need to do. So agents or opening ports or anything like that, not necessary. Um, the only thing, uh, the stuff that you, do, that you need um, is you need SS, the SSH port open, which I think is uh, okay. Um, we actually, the other evening we spoke about a company that closed their SSH ports for some obscure reason. Um, okay, and you need to have Python installed, Python 2, 2.7. Um, if you don't have that installed, it doesn't run server-side. Okay, 
but that's that's okay. And you'll see, I'll, I'll show you a bit of code later of some of the scripts. Um, it's largely self-documenting. Uh, YAML is very nice because it allows commenting. It's not like um, JSON. Uh, it's JSON, there's no possibility to make comments, which is very frustrating. Um, but with, with uh, YAML, you can, you can do that if needs be. Okay. Um, so who's familiar with Ansible? Who's okay, so I'm not alone. So there's, uh, you guys probably know more about this than I do. Okay, so that's just a disclaimer. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start. Um, what is Ansible? It consists of basically three parts, three main parts. The first is it is an automation language. So there's a little language based in um, YAML that you use, um, and then th uh, those YAML scripts are parsed and, and executed by the automation engine. Uh, that runs on your machine. It doesn't run on the server. And then it also has an, uh, a, a, an enterprise framework called Tower. I know absolutely nothing about Tower. So that's why that circle is empty. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. So what does Ansible do? Um, it can do several things. Um, it can do software provisioning. So if you've got a brand new server and you want to install a whole bunch of stuff, um, it can do that for you. Uh, you can uh, do, uh, use it for configuration management if you want to make sure that all the servers that, you, that you're that um, you using is on the same page. Um, it can enforce that for you. Um, application deployment, that's what we use uh, it for um, to a large degree, that's, uh, that and software provisioning. And then other things like continuous delivery and orchestration are things that I haven't touched, touched yet. Okay, so what is it like? Um, and you can vehemently disagree with me, um, but uh, it's, it's fairly simple, especially when you start off with. We've done a few complicated things with it, uh, but I think it's more our fault than Ansible's. Okay, it's uh, human readable. The scripts, and you, you'll see in a, in a, in a bit um, that, uh, how, how you can read it. Um, it's easy to learn, it's intuitive, uh, so as you write your scripts, that's how it's going to be, be executed on the server. And it's quick to get started. I've said that a few times. Pow it's also powerful. Um, there's a wide range of tools. Um, you can interface with cloud platforms, Linux servers, databases, Docker, ugh, name it. Um, uh, Ansible probably has tools for that. Um, and it's just all out of the box. You install it and you just get going. Um, it's agentless, which is nice. Uh, you don't. You you once you've got your server up and running with SSH open and Python installed, which some distros have by default, then you you're good to go. Um, so uh, Linux or Unix-like systems use SSH and, and uh, Windows uses WinRM, which I don't know, know what it is. Um, so no agent installs, and you also don't need to open any additional ports to your machine, which is nice. Okay, um, it's declarative. Now this is, for me, it's major, uh, especially coming from Fabric, where you needed to, to execute uh, or script and execute everything. Um, the fact is, uh, b because it's declarative, you describe to Ansible the, the state that you want your machines to be in. And it will try to get any machine in your inventory in that state, regardless of where it comes from. It can be a brand new machine, or it can be a, a machine that's been running for three years. Um, so it, it runs on all of them, your entire inventory, which for me is major, because you don't have to have separate scripts for, for separate situations, uh, or for, for separate machines, really. Okay, so what is the purpose of Ansible? Um, why would you use it? It reduces complexity. It does simplify things. Uh, it also reduces setup time. It, that can be uh, a lot. And maintenance time. And it improves sharing of know-how. Because these scripts are so human readable, 
once one team member has figured something out and scripted it, it's there for all to see. Okay, so um, it's, it brings uh, things out into the open. Um, reliability improves, consistency, um, productivity, and all of that should help if you have your own business. It can help you to, to make a bit more money or your employer. And if you're the sysadmin, it can also help you to have a bit of a life um, and not worry about the servers all the time. Okay. Uh, so which operating systems does it run on? The control machine, which is the one where you um, manage the, the deployments from, um, is Unix-like, a Unix-like um, system, and it needs to have Python installed. Uh, Python 2 or Python 3, I have not managed to get it working with Python 3, but I haven't spent a lot of time on it. Um, Windows, not so much. Not for the control machine. Okay, For your managed machines or the inventory, you can have Unix-like servers via SSH, you access them. Uh, Windows uh, servers or Windows machines via WinRM. And then you can have a whole host of cloud platforms and you can access them uh, via their APIs. Okay. I show three there, but there's, there are many more. Um, licensing. Okay. Ansible Engine is open source. And uh, Tower initially was not open source, but they, did, they made that open source as well. But if you want enterprise support, you can get that through Red Hat. Okay, so but it's there to use and to, to play around with and get started with. Um, if you want to get started with Ansible, um, there's a number of resources. The, doc the docs are really good. Um, it's, a, it's a nice resource to get started with. Uh, in the documentation, there's an installation guide. It's pretty simple. Um, you also have a list of all the modules that are sorted by categories. Now, the Ansible tools are called modules, so I'll, I'll use that. Uh, that word a lot. So you have a list of modules by category, databases, etc., and I'll, I'll show them in a bit. Um, because it's open source, you can just go and have a look at how they do it um, on GitHub. And there are two repositories where you can get some examples from uh, for different situations, deploying databases or, or whatever. So there's, you, you're not alone when you start off with it. There's a, already a lot there. Okay. Now the concepts, uh, so he, here comes the terminology. So you've got the control machine, you know that as well uh, already. And then you've got the inventory, which is the stuff that you're trying to manage. Uh, the tools, as I said, are called modules, and they are implemented as Python modules. Now a Python module is a Python file. Um, I was quite surprised they're not classes. Um, it's like one uh, Ansible module is one Python file. Okay. So when you build a, uh, an Ansible project, uh, that, that lives inside a directory. So it's not a single file, which is nice because it's modular. Um, the first file that you need to put in there is the Ansible config file. And that's basically to tell it where the, um, the next file is, the host file, which tells you where the inventory is. If you don't tell uh, uh, Ansible that the, the inventory lives in this folder, in this directory, then it will go and look for it in the default, uh, I don't know, etc something. Um, then you can have a number of playbooks. Now the playbooks are the scripts that you run to get a job done. I think the guys who uh, created Ansible are uh, American football fans. There's a, there's a few uh, terms like that coming um, coming through. Okay, so then in this uh, project directory, you also have a, a standard subdirectory called host var. And host vars can contain a single YAML file with configuration for each host in your inventory, if that is necessary. But it gives you the, the, the flexibility to do some specific configuration per host. It also has a, a, uh, a VARS directory, a, a variables directory, standard. And in that um, directory, you can have as many um, 
configuration YAML files as you as you wish. Okay. Um, and then you have uh, another subdirectory called roles, and there you can have in that. Uh, um, a role is contained in its own subdirectory, and a role you can almost say is a is a reusable playbook that you can just call from another playbook. Um, and this makes it modular. When I started off with uh, with Ansible, I wasn't aware of this entire directory structure, um, and everything happened in a single file, and I became really nervous because there was no modularity. But then I I did go a little bit further and I saw that uh, there's, a, there's absolute modularity and, and you can manage it very nicely. So inside a role, the role can have its own variables directory with variable scripts, um, files, a files directory. Now, the files directory con contains resources that you might want to deploy to your server, um, whatever that may be, text files, PDF files or whatever, but uh, you can push that uh, that role has access to those files and it can, can uh, push that to the server. We also have templates, uh, the Jinja templates. And the Jinja templates, you can uh, generate them. It's text files that you can generate by filling in settings located somewhere in a settings file, either in var or host var or the, the global var. Wh wherever you find the setting, you can kind of copy and paste it into, the, into your template and um, have your configuration files um, configured with, with all the, the things that you want for that server. Um, so text templating is a, is a real strength uh, and it works really nicely. Then you have tasks. Now the tasks are the stuff that do, does the, uh, do the actual work. So you can have a task for making, uh, configuring all your security making directories, creating a Docker for the database server, etc. cetera. And um, you can also have handlers, uh, similar to tasks, but they, uh, they, they do um, conditional execution. Only sometimes, uh, depending on what happened in other tasks, you can activate uh, a, a handler and that will run right at the end. Okay. This gives you an idea of the categories of modules. These are not the modules, it's groups of modules. Um, we don't nearly use all of them. The, the ones that are bolded now, uh, we touch, database stuff, file stuff, commands, etc. So we use it very simply still. Okay, uh, but it's vast. It's, it, I don't know how many modules Ansible has, but it's, it's a lot. Okay, so that's enough about Ansible. Um, so you know what our use case was. We had multiple customers, multiple applications, multiple application configurations like production, etc. And we wanted to, to put this all into a central configuration system and have it run. Um, so the, in, in our design concept, we have the um, entities like hosts. Uh, those are the computers. It's already an Ansible concept, so nothing new there. Applications, like I said, we, ha we want to represent and list our applications. Uh, we want to build configuration templates so that we can re reapply them over and over and, and just use, uh, uh, well, do less work. I'm lazy, so I don't do, uh, like doing a lot of repetitive stuff. Then you have configurations. Now, configuration uh, uses a template, and then it does additional things to that and then users as well. And now this refers to admin users specifically and not the, the, uh, the users in our applications because they are contained in, in the Postgres database. Okay, and the lifecycle stages that we wanted to, to manage with Ansible are provisioning, starting off with a blank system and, st um, and installing the basic software. And I'll show you the scripts. Uh, migration, if you have a legacy system, getting it into the, the, the new format. Uh, deployment, deploy all the apps, and then maintenance. If we have to do um, upgrades, etc., that's all the stuff that we wanted to, to manage. Now, what does our solution look like? Um, starts off as a, as a normal Ansible project. Um, in the VARS directory, we have one settings file, which is nice. All the global stuff happens in one file. You, uh, I mentioned earlier that we want one uh, point of configuration. This is largely it. 
uh, you also have to go into the, the host uh, files as well. So, um, so in host var, for each host, you do a bit of work there, which I'll show you now. The roles uh, do the detailed work, and I won't go into too much of that because then we'll just disappear into the detail. And then we have um, one um, playbook for each of the different stages in our lifecycle that we want to um, manage. Now, in the settings file, what do we do? We do generic host configuration. So configuration that applies to all hosts. We do um, application registration. So if we want to make an, an application, a new application part of this um, de deployment system, then you register it there. You also uh, build your, your configuration templates in the central settings file, and you list your admin users and the users that you want to deploy to, to the different systems there as well. In the host variables, what do we do? Uh, we do individual host configurations. That is specifically host dependent, but which is pretty obvious. Um, then we assign an application to this um, host. So it will use, uh, it will run this and this and this, these applications for us. And uh, we also assign which templates we're going to use. Is, is this instance of the application going to be production or testing or uh, whatever? And then um, we do the final application configuration in there, bits that we cannot do in the, in, in the global settings file. This is all still really nice and intuitive. And then um, the, the playbooks give us um, the work that's done in, in this, th these different parts of the life cycle. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to delve into some of the code um, okay. Okay, can you see that? Is it, is it visible? Okay. I can't make this any larger, so, but uh, the fonts in the, the scripts will, will be large enough. But this is basic, basically that directory structure that I mentioned earlier. Okay? It's my Ansible project. Um, and okay, now I have to figure out how I'm going to do this. Uh, the first thing that I want to show you is the settings file. Okay, so uh, like I said, there's generic host configuration there, and then my applications and my admin users. Okay. Um, the, the host is uh, some, a few mundane things here. Um, the database server uh, will always um, be, be located in, in that directory regardless of the, of the host. It has a central uh, port, or, or the st a standard port, and then a, s a standard username on all the, uh, um, the hosts that we deploy. And similarly, you can have for your application servers, um, certain standard settings, um, okay, and then the applications, in this case, we've got two of them, uh, it's, it's not the real ones, but uh, you, you've got app A and app B um, going there, um, and in app A, uh, we can do, again, central configuration, all the configurations of, of this application will use these uh, standard settings, and then you, uh, we have the, the configuration templates for production, testing, training, uh, with all the, their own uh, unique um, content. Okay. Uh, you might see some uh, sensitive resources in my files, uh, like passwords or keys or secrets or whatever. Uh, this is very amateur, uh, but uh, Ansible does have a vault. It does have a mechanism for dealing with those things properly uh, that is encrypted and, and deals with them correctly. Um, okay, so this is the settings file. The, the, the admin users are just uh, simple things. Uh, uh, there's a, an example name, and there's my, it's, it's at least an encrypted password. Um, so that's the settings file. 
that's the high level view of everything that we want to do in the system. Now, host vars per host. So this is again uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, the hosts. Uh, we we can assign host names and backup labels and and things like that. And then I'm telling um, Ansible that I want to run both these applications on this server. Okay, and um, I'm going to create the following configuration. Uh, a production environment for client A, client B as well, and for ourselves, we want a test testing environment on the server and a training environment. And underneath here are the little bits that you still need to add to configure the, to do the final configuration for each of those. Okay, uh, that is host dependent. Okay. Um, the the so having all of those things configured, uh, that centralizes most of your configuration. Um, and then you have these playbooks. So this is what a playbook uh, looks like. So there's a bit of documentation, the name of, of uh, this playbook. Uh, prepare application servers. It's going to run on that part of my inventory. It's a group of servers called um, app hosts. Um, and then it calls these different roles. Server prepare security, server install software, server install Docker, and then I prepare a, a series of Docker images, and I uh, prepare a number of Docker containers, and then I finalize my server, and if needs be, you can have them reboot as well. Um, the migrate and deploy and maintain are, are similar types of things. Um, if we look into just one or two of the roles, just to give you a sense of, of uh, what this is really like. Um, to prepare this, the security on, on a server, this is what we do. Um, so import global settings. My global settings file I imported so, so that I have access to it. And then I create my Linux OS groups. Um, and this is how I do it. It's basically a loop. So this is a list, in, in, if you know YAML, you would know that this is a list. And you loop through all these um, uh, groups and you create them with the group module. So that is one of the, the Ansible tools. Um, the same with creating users. Um, the users in this case you get, we get from the settings file, um, that admin users collection. And it runs through uh, with, the, with a user tool. Um, Assigns a name, comment, password, update password, etc. It does all the, the configuration that you would need. Um, to install our software on, on the server, uh, what does that look like? You can break these uh, task files into, into subfiles, which helps with modularity. Um, so the, the main install file says, again, we import all of our settings. And then we uh, prepare the OS directories and does, uh, do the, the installs. Um, this is where I create all my directories that I want on the server. It's again a list of directories and uh, you can control access, uh, uh, configure the access and everything on them. Uh, the owner and the group, etc. So it's, it's quite complete. Uh, to install the software, uh, you can see there's again a list of things. I like htop and tree. Python pip, uh, and a few things that we run through in a loop, and we then use apt um, to install all of them. Um, and the, the last one, I'm running a bit out of time, is to prepare um, the container for the DB server, for the database server. Um, okay, so this is what we do, um, import the global settings. Um, then we parse our configuration a little bit, and then we create directories like before, create the Docker container, and that's what I wanted to show you. Um, what Tim mentioned earlier. Um, so to create a Docker container over here, uh, this is what it looks like. You specify the image. So in this case, Postgres 10.4. Um, you give it a name, a host name. You map the volumes. Uh, you set the restart policy. It's basically everything that you need to do um, to get this Docker 
uh, contain this data. Okay. I think, okay, I can probably go back to the presentation now. Um, so where does this leave us? Um, so what, what does the um, system look like after uh, Ansible is done with it? Um, we've got the, the database server. I, I don't um, indicate Docker uh, here anymore, but all these are Docker containers, the database server. And we can now have any number of um, application server containers, uh, depending on how much your, your hardware can carry. And then we have the reverse proxy um, from, uh, uh, with Nginx. And if each of uh, the, the application servers has um, a, a unique external port through which we route the, the clients. And with your browser, you can gen then just connect to the, the, the correct um, port, and that will take you through to that um, application server. And of course, um, Ansible still in the game with SSH. So conclusions, good and bad. Um, okay, the good stuff, YAML is, YAML is really great. I love it much more than uh, JSON. It's clear and simple. It's way better than scripting with Fabric. Uh, but maybe that's just me. Uh, the declarative thing is, is, is really great because you describe state. It's not actually, you, you, you don't describe a series of tasks to run. Um, you, des you, you describe the desired state. Um, it, you can do very simple things in a single file with Ansible or you can do an elaborate scheme like we did here. Um, bad, um, you can think with the um, the settings, the global settings and the host settings that we did, there's a bit of connecting things together. Now, that, those lookups and looping does become a little bit complicated and it's not as readable. But if you then make use of comments, it should be fine. Um, Python must be installed. Okay, that's um, intermittent. Uh, when I work on my, my Linux PC, I sometimes have a, a, a SSH connection issue. Uh, but I've kind of figured um, out ways around it. Uh, it's an irritation, but it's not major. Yeah. There's one other thing. Um, I haven't uh, succeeded in, in uh, connecting directly into a Docker container from remote. It is possible. You don't use SSH, then you use uh, a Docker connection. Uh, but that's still something that we need to do. We actually have on our hosts now its own instance of Ansible that deals with all the Docker containers, which is not ideal, but okay. It's, it's working for now. Okay, that's it from me. Any questions? Stunned silence. You appear to be. Is this on? It appears to be using uh, what is it, uh, Debian? Uh, have you considered uh, to check out DevOps to run on top of uh, Ansible? Oh uh, no, I don't even know about it. We use Ubuntu, not Debian. Um, it's still based on the yeah, Debian. Yeah, it's it's based on Debian. Yeah. No, I, I don't even know about it. So I'll DevOps. Okay, I'll have a look at it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Any more questions? Comments? Tomato is thrown. Okay, I think that's it for me. We've got one minute. I made it. Okay, before you run away. Okay. Or before they run away. Lunch today is being served in the Silver Oak Chamber. Um, so when you, from the courtyard, turn right, go through the little archway, follow the pathway to your left. You'll see they're busy setting up a big. Um, stage structure with lights and that. You go a little bit past that, and then the restaurant is on the left. You'll see some green chairs on the outside of the restaurant. That's the oak chamber. That's where lunch is today, and it's served from four, three, two, one, about now. And one o'clock, the next set of talks starts. Thanks.